Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. As the president of Harvard China Education Symposium and the chief executive officer of 2012 China Education Symposium Annual Conference, I have to say congratulations to all of us just for our exhausting but exciting journey in the past 24 hours. Just within 24 hours, we have even 12 speakers in three panels, six workshops in four topics, 12 presentations in two pitches, two meals, three snack breaks, and fantastic communication and discussion in the hall and outside. And there is a theme of innovation of China education, scholars, social entrepreneurs, and practitioners from China and North America just share their careers and ideas with an audience of over 200 students from all around the country and even beyond. They talk about their areas from diverse perspectives. For better education in China, our shared value and shared purpose. We do deserve more in a greater context. We have talked about social entrepreneurship. We have talked about technology implementation. We have talked about humanistic and art education. And now it's time to think about China's education and globalization. As you know, reform and innovation of education in China determines the prospect of one-fifth of human beings on the planet and will make a difference to the future of the whole world. Before we close the conference and send best wishes to you for an even longer, even more exhausting and more exciting journey after you leave here, it's a time to think about China in a global context. With an interconnected and integrated world, what will be the future of China's education and how to think about China's education and globalization? We are more than happy to have this special keynote speaker today to join us. That's Professor Fernando Ramers. Actually, rather than Professor Ramers, we often see Fernando here. He is the Director of International Education Policy Program in Harvard and Ford Foundation Professor of International Education. So now please join me in welcoming Professor Fernando Ramers to give us a closing remark on China's education and globalization. Thank you very much. I want to congratulate all of you for your interest in stimulating innovation in education through technology and entrepreneurship. And I want to recognize the organizers of this conference, Mei Huang, Ling Yunji, Xini Huang, Jun Zhe Shu, Lili Zhu, Yi Ling Kong, Bo Zhu, Hu Chung Chung, and Wei Zhang, because they also are entrepreneurs who are generating innovation. There is tremendous growth from last year to this year. This very conference was an idea of a small group of people who thought they would be valuable in building connecting tissue between people who will be future leaders uh, in China of a, with an interest in education. And to see that this conference ha not, has now reached the stage where it is truly a national conference, where some of you come uh, from other universities in the East Coast, from some universities in the West Coast. Some of you have come from China to share your innovations. It is, I think, a true sign of accomplishment for the conference. So you are the future for education in, in China. What I would like to do today is talk about what I think are some of the most exciting opportunities for education reform, not only in China, but in this country and indeed around the world. So I hope to make a few remarks and then have a little bit of a conversation with you at the end. The world has witnessed over the last four centuries a dramatic set of educational improvements. Four centuries ago, most people around the world did not have the opportunity to be educated. And it was these men, John Comenius, who proposed, who had the idea, that in order to have peace, it would be a good thing to give every person the chance to be educated. 
but we did not have the technology to make this idea a reality. The idea only began to become a reality 200 years later in countries like Prussia, in some parts of Europe, where they began to build public education systems. In this country, the construction of a public massive education system is a very recent idea, 150 years ago, ago in this Commonwealth, Horace Mann began to build a coalition to advocate so that every town would create a school publicly funded for all children. But really around the world, this idea is even more recent. It's an idea that began with the creation of the UN system and with the inclusion in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of Article 26, which guarantees the basic right of education as a basic human right. And the construction of the UN system really created an architecture, a global architecture, where governments around the world got together, became very serious about providing every child the opportunity to be schooled. So if you look at the number of children enrolled in schools, if you look at the percentage of children enrolled in school over the last 100 years, the story is a story of dramatic success because 100 years ago, even 60 years ago, the vast majority of the world's children did not have the opportunity to be educated, and today they do. And they spend in school a number of years. This dramatic story of expansion is even more recent in China. It's a story of the last several decades where the country has transformed the structure of educational opportunity in a relatively short time. Perhaps the most dramatic story of expansion of educational opportunity in the history of humanity has taken place in China. But it's not just expansion in the number of years that people spend in school. It's also expansion in terms of our aspirations for what will come as a result of that expansion. So 60 years ago, we expected that people will develop the basic literacies and increasingly, we expect more and more from that. I encourage you to take a look at official policy documents in China 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, now. And what you will see is a, an increase, a dramatic increase in aspirations in what we expect that people will draw from their education. We expect now that most people around the world will be empowered citizens, people who have not just the skills to have the basic literacies, but people who gain as a result of their education the capacity to become self-authoring individuals, actors, shapers of their own destiny, people who are capable of transforming the world. So basically, this is a history of, of transformation, of expansion of a vision for humanity. Now, I want to pause just to get us to reflect on what that expanded vision could mean. This is a picture taken in a small little school in the West Coast. They like to call themselves the Harvard of the West. It's not really the Harvard, not really the Harvard of the West. This is the computer science department in this little school. And the name of this computer science department is the William J. Gates Building of Computer Science. And you can imagine why this is called the William J. Gates Building in Computer Science, because Mr. Gates funded the construction of this building. I am told, I don't know if this is true, but I am told that Mr. Gates had only one condition uh, to give this money to this little school in the West, and the condition was that this building should be in this particular location, which is diagonally across from the window of a professor in the mathematics department. Now, there is a story to this professor. This professor was a visiting professor here at Harvard when Mr. Gates was an undergraduate student. And Mr. Gates took his class, and he obtained an F in that class. He did very poorly. And I'm told that when Mr. Gates went home that summer, that F really discouraged him from coming back. And that, and because he was more, more excited about building uh, this, this technology, he decided 
not to come back to Harvard uh, and instead to pursue his, the creation of his enterprises. So I suppose his intention in asking that this building be located uh, across from the window of his old professor would be to tell him so many years later every morning to greet his professor, how are you? How do you like me now? But I think the point of this story, if you stop and think about it, is that the F that Mr. F that Mr. Gates obtained in that course obviously had zero predictive value of the kinds of contributions that Mr. Gates would make to an entire industry in the world, to this economy and to the world economy. And I think that to any of us interested in education, this is a very important story because it's a story that reminds us that the kinds of outcomes that we have for educational institutions are long-term outcomes. They are outcomes about providing individuals with the skills so that they can do something for themselves and for others, so they can change the world. But the kinds of measurements that we often use to guide our work are very narrow measurements. So we all know that if we think about long-term outcomes, there are many components of an education that are important. Not only basic academic outcomes, performance in literacy or even mathematics or science, but the development of character, of leadership skills, the capacity to persevere, empathy, the ability to work with other people, the capacity to listen, the capacity to reach agreement, these are all very, very important outcomes so that individuals can become self-authoring individuals. And yet, in this country and in many countries around the world, we are living at a time where a very powerful driver of education reform is what are called standard-based reforms. And what are these standard-based reforms? They basically say define in rather focused ways the outcomes that we expect of the education system measure those outcomes and then attach some consequences to the achievement of those measurements. And of course, it's a very powerful idea in business that the only thing that we can manage is what we can measure. But what if what we're measuring is only a very narrow slice of what is important and not the full range of competencies that we know will matter? What if what we measure only gives, you, gives us the very small kind of window that the visiting professor who taught Mr. Gates here so many decades ago had when he judged his talent. We might miss what's truly important. We might not cultivate what's truly important. So I think this is one of the challenges for any innovator. It's the challenge of making sure that we pay attention to the relevance of what we teach, to those long-term outcomes. And in thinking about relevance, we have to think what makes an education relevant is what is the connection with the external world outside schools? Schools are not self-contained institutions or high schools or universities. They exist so that they can transform the world outside the schools. And that world is changing very, very rapidly. It is changing at an exponential rate. And these are seven um, vectors of those changes. And I would like to suggest to submit today that in thinking about educational innovation, the most important thing we can do is to ask the question, what are we doing to make sure that education is relevant relative to those drivers? I think it was Peter Drucker, although some people say that it was really Abraham Lincoln, who argued that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So the best way to prepare young people in China for the future is to prepare them to invent it. But in doing that, it is absolutely indispensable that we take account, that we take notice of what are these vectors that are changing at, at accelerating speed. And I would like to suggest that they are the first one, the expectation that schools will achieve not one, but multiple objectives. And this is an expectation now, not just for elite schools, but for all schools. I was had the opportunity to participate in the celebration of the 60th anniversary of the high school, the Renmin-affiliated high school in Beijing a couple of years ago. 
And I was very pleased to see that in that celebration, that school is very committed to the cultivation of a multiple range of talents. Now I know that many of you will say, but not all schools in China are like that school. You should see the schools in rural areas. You should see the schools that ordinary kids go. But I think one of the changes is, because of communications, what is happening in Renmin uh, affiliated high school is known throughout China, is known throughout the world. And I think it is raising the expectations that all students have for their education. No one will be happy if they go to a school that expects them just to learn a narrow set of skills, to sit and listen and practice road learning. So that's one vector. And I think that's a great opportunity. Um, we had yesterday here a think tank on educational innovation. One of the things I do uh, at Harvard is to teach a course on educational innovation and social entrepreneurship. And as part of this course, students produce designs. They produce uh, innovative enterprises. Some of you are in that class and produce some of those ventures. And we end up that course with a celebration of those creations. And we bring in outside speakers and everybody presents their design. And some people have gone on to actually raise the funds to implement these ideas. So many of those innovations yesterday were precisely about that expanded vision for education. We had an entire panel, for example, which was about helping students learn foreign languages, helping students develop intercultural competency, the capacity to work with peers from other countries. That's part of an expanded vision. We had uh, some platforms, some online platforms that were about uh, allowing young people to explore a range of careers, a range of different careers before deciding what do they really want to study. So that's one vector. The second vector is, as I have mentioned, the accelerated rate of change, of technological change. I am sure that any of you in your cell phones have more computing power than the computer power that existed in one of the earlier computers at Harvard some 40 years ago. You can visit it in the Science Center. It's a huge computer uh, that takes the equivalent of half of this entire wall. And that had a fraction of the computing power in this device. And we have just begun to see the tip of the iceberg of what the use of this technology will make possible for us. I was today, this morning, at another meeting organized celebrating educational innovation at Harvard and around the world. And one of the guests to that meeting is a graduate of the program that I direct here, a woman who created an online company in Brazil to produce educational disruption, to produce positive disruption, positive change. The concept of disruption is one that was invented by my colleague, Professor Clay Christensen, at the business school. And Professor Christensen has studied how, diff how different industries change. And he says there are two kinds of change. There is incremental change as organizations become better and better at what they are doing. And so, for example, in a place like Harvard, there has been, in our almost 400 years history, a lot of incremental change, new programs that we create, improvements to what we do. But he says sometimes an industry is completely transformed as a result not of incremental change but of disruptive change. Disruptive change happens when someone begins a very different approach, a very new approach to serve a group that has previously been ignored. And at the beginning they do it in a way that is absolutely non-threatening to the existing system until serving that group allows them to have the growth and the resources so they perfect a technology that eventually throws the dominant industry out of business. And so, of course, there is a lot of opportunity for disruption in education, even in higher education. Why? Because there are so many people who are still excluded. Worldwide, only 1% of the population that could go to college and university goes to university. And there is reason to think that it's going to be very difficult to serve that population using the traditional models. But we now have the internet. We now have cloud computing. It is now possible for any of you who is entrepreneurial to begin to put together on the web to catalog the resources which are available online. There is one person who has done that with a very small team. He created what he calls the University of the People. You can find him online. 
And it's basically, he has organized a lot of resources to have access to higher education at zero cost to the user. Now, this is a real opportunity for disruption. In very old institutions like Harvard, we don't imagine that this is going to take us out of business anytime soon. But the truth is, we don't know that. And because we don't know that, Harvard just announced last week that we're going to begin a joint venture with MIT producing what is called edX. And I imagine you have talked about that. So that's the second vector. Technology makes now possible for any of you to do things that would have been unimaginable five years ago, 10 years ago, in terms of having a very large scale impact and perhaps even to disrupt the educational industry. A third vector is the development of communications technology in particular, with costs that are declining very, very rapidly. Fourth, we know a lot more today about how the brain works, about how the mind works than we did in the past. And there is an opportunity in mobilizing that knowledge to generating very transformative experiences. So we know, for example, that there is no direct pathway from contemplating a problem to knowing what to do about the problem, to having the skills to solve it. And in that respect, much of the existing education around the world does not really help people have the skills to act on what they know. It makes them very passive observers. And because we have that knowledge that, there, that in order to learn to do, you have to do. You have to have the opportunity to do. Educational institutions are beginning to experiment with new forms of pedagogy. One of them is what is called expeditionary learning, active learning. At Harvard, we began this year, we established something called the Innovation Lab. And the whole point of the Innovation Lab is to give students the opportunity to do. Some of us in our classes use these pedagogies. In my class in entrepreneurship, I apply very basic principles which are known. People learn because they have to do. So the students know they will have to produce a design. There is no option. They know that from day one. And I bring to the class people who are already themselves entrepreneur and give the students the opportunity to communicate with entrepreneurs, to be mentored by them, but to also be inspired by them, to understand that they could be like these entrepreneurs. So recent knowledge about how the brain works, how people learn, gives us a foundation that gives us the opportunity to rethink educational institutions. Fifth, we're all going to live much longer. And this gives us a lot of opportunities and some challenges. So in the old days, when people lived until the age of 35 or 40, we thought that the way to educate people, say, for leadership was to educate them in universities at a relatively young period in life then send them into the world and wish them well, because they were going to leave maybe 20 years after that, and then they will retire and die. This is no longer true. Most of you can expect to leave at least until the age of 100, if not more, if you take care of your health longer. There are huge educational implications of that. One of them is we have to teach people to take care of their health, because it is not a very good idea to leave a long life if you're going to be very ill in the last ages, uh, in the last years of your life. So we have to teach people to take care of their health early on. The second thing is, it is very unlikely that people will have the same career for a long time because technology is going to change the, str the economy. Most of the jobs that the people who are going to school today in China will do have not been invented yet. The technologies have not been invented yet. Look at this rate of technological change. So there is a huge implication, which is the most important thing we can teach people in school is not to give them a basic set of skills to perform one job, is to give them the skills, the motivation, the curiosity to retrain themselves multiple times, to be independent learners, to know how to learn new things. I think. In 2012, it should be an expectation that most students would know how to learn online. We know that not everybody has the skills to learn independently online. We should be making that a basic 
skill like speaking a foreign language because that is how most people are going to be retrained and are going to keep up with their careers and with the changes in technologies and so on. At Harvard, five years ago, we launched an innovation. We called it the Advanced Leadership Initiative. It's an attempt to redefine a stage of life. We bring to the university people who have retired from at least one career. On average, they're 60 years old. In the past, this university had no programs for people who are 60 years old. And now we bring people of great accomplishment because we think that life begins at 60, that it is at 60 that they have the wisdom and the maturity to really take on really grand challenges. And we work with them and we connect them with our graduate students and the results are marvelous, are very invigorating for all parties involved, for our graduate students, for the advanced leadership fellows. We expect that in the future more and more educational institutions will recognize this untapped market the many people who want to continue learning, who want to be able to come to a university to reinvent themselves, to be ready for their next stage of leadership. Globalization, of course, is one of the changes that, is, that should drive whether education remains relevant. The fact that we now are in contact, much greater contact with one another as a result of telecommunication technology, as a result of trade, as a result of cultural exchanges, as a result of migration and travel. There are some people who have already risen to the opportunities created by globalization. Some of you here represent the Amazon Educational Foundation. I serve on their advisory board. Very entrepreneurial founder, Sean Zhang, is in the business of helping to promote cultural exchanges between Chinese students and American students because his expectation is that in the next decades these students are going to have to have a much better understanding of one another and have the skills to do things jointly in business, in culture, in politics and so on. So globalization is a big opportunity and I'm going to refer in a little while to one of the most exciting innovations that I have been a part to which is an attempt to redesign an entire school around globalization. And lastly, very important challenge are, challenge are new and renewed forms of violence related to the exclusion of some groups in the society. One of the results of globalization is that some people are doing very, very well, but not everybody is doing very, very well. And that is increasing the gaps within a society. So even if poverty is being reduced in some places, globalization is increasing the gap and communications makes very visible this gap. And this creates instability in many places. So there is a violence that we need to pay attention to because it is a challenge to the ability to govern in any nation. So these are some of the drivers that I submit we should be thinking about when we think about education. Now what, is, what are some possible uh, responses, educational responses to these challenges? Well, the expectation that schools will achieve multiple objectives is personalized. And of course, technology is a wonderful way to personalize. It should be possible to have highly personalized curricula for all students. Different people are interested in different things. They learn at different rates. They have different strengths in different subjects. The traditional mode of education that expects everyone to be learning the same thing at the same time at the same speed makes no sense. And it's unnecessary in this day and age. It, I think the time will be soon where we will have schools in an iPad, where we'll have through an iPad access to a vast library of resources that makes it possible for students to access what they are interested in, when they are interested in, and to cover an entire curriculum. So personalization is one response. Um, the exponential growth, of course, we're going to have to make a much greater effort in teaching both science but also technology. It is impossible to participate in life in the 21st century without a serious un understanding of science and technology. Some of the students who may be here uh, in the class who presented in the innovation think tank yesterday have developed a fantastic intervention to promote STEM. Very simple program to promote STEM. Do you want to say a word about that, Bo, just very quickly? You know which project that is, of course, yeah. For girls, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
mathematics. And if you're interested in that innovation, you should talk to Bo. They are launching it, in fact, today, right? They are testing it in one place. And this innovation is ready. They are looking for capital to go to scale, but it's going very well. Um, of course, we're going to have to teach the ability to solve problems. We're going to have to teach entrepreneurship. I'm so excited that a big emphasis of this conference has been on the role of entrepreneurial solutions to generate innovation. But what we need is not just to use entrepreneurship to stimulate change in education. We need to provide students with entrepreneurial skills themselves so they have the capacity when confronting a problem to ask not what is somebody going to do about this problem, but what am I going to do about this problem? What's my solution? In the same way that Bo and her colleagues have created, have designed an approach to teach science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to girls and young women in this country. So, I want to talk about innovation, and there is a little story. In this country, a group of people, a group of engineers, really, and inventors, have created an approach to stimulate innovation called the X Prize. And the X Prize is simply a competition. They put out a competition and they say, let's see, who can design a spaceship that can go to space and travel around and come back so that we can commercialize that? And whoever wins is going to earn X million of dollars and we will get venture capital to build that. And that was one actual competition. I think about 35 teams, global teams, participated. Second thing, they said, how can we design a way to clean oil spills? 40, 45 people participated. What is interesting is that in this approach to innovation, the average team had something like 30 people. And they actually did produce new technologies to clean oil spills and so on. This is a very powerful thing. Our own president at Harvard was so inspired by these approaches that this year she launched a grand challenge to stimulate innovation. And she offered a small reward to teams of students that produced innovative solutions to education, public health, energy, and other social challenges. 300 students participated. They produced extremely creative designs. I was one of the members of the panel that read these studies. The average team had only three people, and the designs were brilliant. One of the winners, for example, is someone who developed a whole new textbook to teach physics on an iPad a really highly interactive textbook to teach physics at the college level. Three people can do that. Stop and think about this. That three people can today do what in the past it took a large publishing company to do. That 30 people today can design a spaceship, what it took in the past a big government organization or private organization to do. That's remarkable. But how do we cultivate those skills? so that people actually are capable in small teams to do that. I think that is a challenge. By this, with the way, the same people who created Singular, um, um, the X Prize have created a campus in Silicon Valley called Singularity University. You should look at Singularity. It's a very interesting idea. People come there for three months, and they do three things. They study what are some of the biggest global challenges that need solutions, that need disruptive change, they study what are the emerging technologies, and they create companies very much along the same lines that some of you are already doing with your innovations. Entrepreneurship, of course, is very active around the world. I'm at the moment doing an evaluation of the impact of a program to teach young people in the Middle East the skills to be entrepreneurial. Short program, only 12 weeks where students basically do what they do in my class. The power of that program I'm finding is remarkable in teaching students who are 15, 16, 17 years old that they can indeed make a difference, that they can change the world, that they have the skills. I interviewed, um, they had a and it's again a system of competitions. I interviewed some of the winners of this regional competition uh, in Morocco not long ago. And there was a group of young girls, 15 years old, who had created a company to produce books, children's books, storybooks, 
that could be re uh, read to little kids by their parents as a way to promote literacy. I mean, imagine, how many people do you know who at the age of 15 have the skills to take a big problem, this was a group of girls from Oman, and the problem was low academic achievement of students in schools to study the problem and to identify a point of entry. And they said the reason we have low academic achievement is because many people struggle reading. They don't read very well. And the reason they don't read very well is because when they were little, their parents didn't read to them. And the reason they, their parents didn't read to them is because there were not many things that they could read. We're going to solve that by creating a solution, a local language publishing program. At the age of 15, this is remarkable. Imagine what these girls will be able to do at the age of 25, 35, 45. So entrepreneurship, obviously, is a way to respond. Let me uh, very quickly only talk about an example of what responding to globalization might mean in terms of educational innovation. Obviously, it could mean promoting student exchanges in the way Amazon does. It could mean using online platforms to enable, to allow students to collaborate uh, on peer-based learning across different places. Um, I have been working for the last uh, few years, uh, just give me a second, in the design of a curriculum for a big innovation called the Avenues School. And the Avenue School is trying to invent a school for the 21st century, invent a new curriculum. And, and I designed, I led a team that designed for them something called the World Course. And the World Course is a course that begins in kindergarten, ends in high school, 10 hours a week. And the whole purpose of the World Course is to teach students what is globalization, what are some of the biggest global challenges, to give them the skills to care about those challenges, and to give them the capacity to do something about them, about those challenges. And so I can't get into too many details of what the world course entails, but I will end with some uh, good news. It's an outcomes-based curriculum. We began this curriculum with a team of people here at Harvard defining what should these graduates know, care about, and be able to do at the end of their high school education. This is a project-based curriculum. The students are always doing things the way they do in my own classes here at Harvard. There is an emphasis in doing, in active learning, expeditionary learning. Emphasis is not just in knowledge, but in actual skills and in attitudes. Every year, beginning in kindergarten, the students have to perform, have to demonstrate that they have understood and that they can translate their knowledge into skills that allow them to produce something. There are coherent themes every year. The units are absolutely interdisciplinary. They learn about public health. They learn about energy. They learn about global politics, of course. They learn about history, geography, um, new knowledge and content, emphasis in fostering agency, voice, this sense that you can make a difference, you can change the world. Well, I will tell you that the world school is expanding rapidly. Uh, their goal is to establish 20 schools around the world. Uh, they are now in conversations, and they are quite advanced, these conversations, to establish very soon an avenue school in Brazil and one in China, in Beijing, very close to Renmin affiliated high school. And I have looked at the plans for the school in China. It is going to be the most beautiful of the world schools, much more beautiful than the school um, in New York. So. To me, these are the kinds of things, sometimes we forget that the institutions that we take for granted, whether it is Harvard University or elementary schools or Beijing University, at some point began with an idea. They began as an act of imagination. They began as a concept. And this concept was generated by people like you and like me, who had not only the creativity to imagine what would be possible, but who had the skills to translate that vision into reality. My hope is that what the, this conference is doing, this social innovation, by bringing you together, is to remind you 
that as people who are capable of imagining a much better education system in China and in the world, a, mo a system that provides an education that is relevant, that this bringing together will remind you that you're not alone and that together, in partnership with others, you are capable of achieving great things. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do we have time to take two or three questions, maybe? Yeah, we don't advertise it as 60 years old because we can't do that, but we say people who have substantial experience. Um, things that these senior people are talking and sharing with students. Anything like the value from years that they, al they also share? Because this is, I think it's a problem in China and U.S. as well. Some you know, cultural good values and moral standards being, being di you know, loose and weakened. So it's curious about, because you mentioned they work really well. Anything including values? I, I, I haven't reflected systematically on your, on your question. I do find that the individuals who do come to the program are indeed very interested. In the, I mean, they understand that uh, any society is built on a fabric that has an ethical backbone, that this is very, very important. And I think that's part of how they think leadership. It's very interesting. Yesterday, I invited to this think tank on innovation uh, to be a discussant, a colleague from the business school who is now very involved in the rethinking of the MBA. Uh, our MBA was essentially designed a hundred years ago to produce leaders in business. And the reflection on developing the ethical component of it is very, very central to what they're doing. So I, I apologize, I haven't really reflected enough on how uh, what we're learning in ALI speaks to that question on the interests and characters and so on. But I do think that this is, of course, yeah, a very so important aspect of thinking about an education for the 21st century. It's a very important piece yeah, of, of making education that allows us to have a more sustainable uh, future, sustainable and peaceful future. Yeah. I know talk about business school. I know a few years ago after the financial crisis, they actually, you know, put more weight into more education required courses right here in Harvard Business School. Yep. Yeah, no. yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, hi. Um, so thank you very much for this talk. It's really stimulating. I love this talk. And based on the talk, I believe the class you teach on social entrepreneur and global education is a great class, although I, I can't be there. I'm not at Harvard. Well, I also uh, teach it online, so you're welcome to take it online through the extension oh school. So you're welcome to do I'm that. Definitely. I'm glad to do I'm glad to know that. So um, it's rather, a, well, I guess a recommendation to you and uh, opportunity information for the for the people here, I mean, you you have great idea about globalization, and social, like social entrepreneur. I don't know whether you know a program called Semester C. Um, I have heard about it. Yes. Okay. Now it's hosted by University of Virginia. It's mm -hmm. also a great university. And I want to say, I mean, if you have such a great idea on globalization, and social entrepreneur, I I think you might, in your sabbatical year, you might want to teach on that ship. Well, so think you. about that. I mean, you're really great for, and for that kind of job. Cause yeah. I, I agree that those experiences are obviously very, very powerful, very, very important. Yeah. yeah. When you teach globalization, you show the students about the local communities in Brazil. You teach entrepreneur and you, t you show them the social service organization around I the world. That's a I great I think it is, of course. I agree with you that it's... Um, it's very powerful for people to be able to travel around the world and to have some interaction with others around the world. I think that there are many ways to do that. Certainly mm -hmm. in the program which I direct here, 
um, one of the ways in which we try to prepare our students for global leadership uh, is by constructing a class of students that is very diverse. Uh, we have people who have been in any given year in at least 40 different countries in the same class. And that's very powerful, to spend an entire year with colleagues discussing the same issues with peers who have experiences in 40 different countries is, is, is um, very potent. Uh, we also put our students through a number of activities in touch uh, with many different global opportunities. For example, uh, using online technology, we construct um, internships for our students. And so some of our students have been working in Mexico. Some have been working in the Middle East. Some have been working in Washington, all from here, online. We also certainly bring a lot of people from other places to interact with our students. 